For those of you who know Kevin, uh, he needs no introduction. Uh, for those of you that don't, um, some have called him the uh, world's most famous uh, computer hacker. Uh, he's had several books written about him, a movie made about him. He's the author of uh, several books with a new one that came out this week, which is a tell-all. Um, his story, in short, is, um, I'll let him leave the details to you, but he basically hacked into several Fortune 500 companies, government agencies, uh, phone companies, uh, then spent uh, three years on the run. Uh, and then finally got caught and spent uh, five years behind bars. Uh, so with that, a warm welcome to uh, Kevin Mitnick. Thank you, Eric. So, I mean, how does one become the world's most famous computer hacker? Wow, that takes a lot of, uh, a lot of doing. Actually, I started as a 10-year-old. I was fascinated with magic. And I love doing magic tricks. And then in high school... I was introduced to a student who could do magic with the telephone system. And he's what they call the phone freak. And if you, I don't know, how many of you read 2600 Magazine? So you got a few of you in here. So phone freaking was like the predecessor to hacking. And, and I was just like taken aback with what this kid could do. I, I gave him my mom's name and he was able to get our unlisted telephone number at home. I, uh, he gave me this special number that you would call. You'd call this secret number and you'd hear like a weird tone you put in five digits, and then you can call anywhere in the world for free. Not that I had to call anyone, but I liked calling the time in Australia because I thought it was cool. And at the time, I thought it was a fluke with the telephone system, but it actually probably was some poor soul's MCI account. And uh, just all the cool stuff he could do with the phone. So I was a prankster, and I loved pulling cool tricks. So the first thing that I did was I uh, changed a friend's class of service to that of a payphone. So whenever he or his parents tried to make a call, they would say, please deposit a dime. <laughs> Did they actually get this recording? I actually have the recording on my iPhone. Uh, so you imagine you're you're at the you're you're at home. You go to make a call, and this is what you hear. The call you have made requires a ten cent deposit. Please hang up momentarily. Listen for dial tone. Deposit ten cents and dial your call again. And no, so, so I was really into like pulling pranks with the with the telephone system, and that was my passion. Was really just to learn all about telephony. And, uh, and then when the, compu uh, when the phone companies started switching over to electronic switching systems, that's when they had front-end computers that were involved, and that's why I became interested in hacking. Actually, I, did, wasn't really, I didn't even want to go to learn about computers. I had a friend in high school that says, hey, you would really love computer class. And, and then I talked to the instructor, and I said, hey, I'd like to take a computer class. And he asked me what my prerequisites, uh, you know, what, what classes I had done before. And I didn't have calculus, and I didn't have some other prerequisites. So he says, I couldn't get it. So then, I said, then my friend was there, and he goes, show him some of the tricks you can do with the telephone. <laughs> and then, okay, we're going to let you in. We're going to waive the prerequisites. And probably that was, um, probably he's regarding that today. Because <laughs> all the cr crazy stuff I did. I mean, the first thing I used to do is, like, dial up to USC, um, so I could play their computer games because they were they had better games than they did in high school, and they had an Olivetti terminal, an acoustic coupler, 110 baud modem. So you can imagine 110 baud. Any of you have, have uh, computed at those uh, dialed up at those super fast speeds? Uh, in any event, our dial I, they had a phone in the room, so it was restricted. You couldn't dial out. So what I used to do is call the operator and say, "Hi, this is Mr. Christ." I need you to connect me to this number, and that would be the dial-up for SC. So after he figured out what was going on, because all the kids in class were playing, playing computer games on USC's computers, because they actually had a much better gaming library, he brought in a phone lock, and he says, I found the one thing that's going to stop Kevin from dialing up to USC. He proudly places the phone lock in the one, you know, because of rotary phone in number one, and I go, hey, that's cool. How much did that cost you? And he goes, oh, like five, six, seven bucks. I said, let me show you a cool trick. So, of course, I asked him for a phone number, and I just simply pulsed out on the switch hook, you know, the number I wanted to dial. His face turns red, and he actually threw the phone across the room. <laughs> so, you, were, you were quite quite the prankster anyhow. I mean, most kids, you know, in their adolescent days go, you know, toilet papering houses. Yeah. You, 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 you had your other... Mine was electronics, gag. you know. To tell us, like, the McDonald's story. I mean. Oh, my God. That, that's kind of my favorite hack of all time is taking over the drive-up window at McDonald's. 
so you could imagine the fun you could have at 16, 17 years old. Um, I used to, uh, my friends and I would sit like across a, a busy street in Los Angeles. I don't know if you know the area. It's like Ventura Boulevard. It's like a, it's, it's huge. It's like Broadway here. And when customers would drive up, I had an, a ham radio that I modified that I can go on, uh, I can go on McDonald's frequencies. So I could actually take over the drive up window. So the guy with the headset inside, he could hear what's going on, right? But was powerless to do anything. So people would drive forward, you know, I'd take their order, you know, they'd ask for a Big Mac, large fry, large Coke, and say, hey man, we don't serve burgers here anymore. You have to go down to Taco Bell, you know, and stuff like that. But the better one is when the cops drove up. Because I see the cops go up and I go, oh, hide the cocaine, hide the cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> And then, you know, 16, 17, you're a little bit immature. So, um, you think? Uh, just a little. Uh, so a customer would drive up, uh, place their order. Yeah, I'm sorry, sir, our ice machine's broken, but in lieu of uh, sodas, we're giving out free apple juice. And uh, would you like small, medium, or large? And they'd always say large, right, because it's free. And then we had a recording of what sounded like urinating in a cup. <laughs> would you please drive forward, sir? You know, and... And of course, at one time, it got too much for the guy, the manager at McDonald's. And he come, he, he, he's out of the store. He's walking around the parking lot looking to every car to see who the culprit is. He sees nothing because we're way across the street. And we're kind of laughing. We're really, sitting so there laughing. And then he, he walks up to the drive-up window speaker. And he places his head in the speaker like he's going to see something. And of course, I couldn't resist. I pressed down the mic. I go, what the fuck are you looking at? And this guy, he flew back like 25 feet, right? So that's actually my favorite hack, is McDonald's. So. But, but earlier on, you, right, you, you got caught even for, for some of those hacks, right? Not for McDonald's. I got, uh, I got uh, my first time really in trouble was we went dumpster diving at a Pacific Bell building. And then uh, we, I decided to see if we could social engineer our, in, our way inside because we were very interested in this system at the phone company called Cosmos. And our objective there was just to go in there and like look at the manuals, try to see if we can get a few passwords. But we went a little overboard. We decided we're going to take some manuals out, copy them, and return them. But at, since it was so late at Did night... to the dumpster? No, we actually got into the building. And that's what I got in trouble for, you know, obviously, you know. And... We tried to, re to return them, but then we were afraid to go back. So uh, ended up getting into hot water for that. What kind of hot water did you get into? Oh, well, like in arrested. <laughs> Actually, because somebody told on uh, one of the uh, friends of a friend told on us and uh, ended up. It, it's all in Ghost in the Wires. It was like, I mean, I remember when the police pulled, uh, pulled me over. Uh, I was working at, uh, in, in the San Fernando Valley is one of the, the district attorney actually showed up. And actually, he's kind of a friend of mine now, is Stephen Cooley. He's now the district attorney in Los Angeles County. And he's yelling to the guys, search the car for a logic bomb, search the car for a logic bomb, because they thought it was like an, ex, an, IE, you know, an explosive device when they didn't know it was a piece of code. So that was kind of like, OK. <laughs> so, but other than the final big arrest, you, you've had several run-ins with the law. Unfortunately, yes. I mean, I was so I was so passionate with hacking. It came to be like a, somewhat of an obsession for me. And it wasn't about stealing money or causing damage or writing viruses or worms. It was really about the the thrill of getting in. And uh, this thrill was, you know, overpowering my my common sense. And uh, I ended up getting in, into into some trouble. Like, and then then I started playing um, cat and mouse with the government. And at one point, I. I knew that the federal government was investigating me. So what I did is I hacked into the cellular phone company at the time, because back in those times, you had wireline and wireless. And I found the cell phones that belonged to the FBI agents that were like watching me. So I decided I would watch them. So I had real time access to the CDRs to the call detail records. So I can kind of see who they're calling, who's calling them, where they physically were. And then at one point, I, I had this device that could monitor the cell site in my local area, and it would monitor the data channel. And this was on AMPS. This is not an AMPS. This is not GSM. This is the AMPS system. And anytime you pass into a cell site, 
um, your phone registers. Anytime you get a call, it does a page. And this is on the old AMP system. So I'd, I had all these FBI cell phone numbers, and I put them into the, my computer. That would, okay, so you had a scanner that's listening to the control channel interfaced into this special box to a piece of software. So I can simply program in a list of phone numbers. And if those phone numbers ever register in that cell site, it alerts me. So one morning I go to work. I was working as a private investigator. I go into work. I put, we see the irony there? <laughs> so I go into work. I put in the code to disable the alarm to the office. And I still hear this beeping sound. And I hear beep, beep, beep. And I start walking in the hall towards my office. And it's getting louder. And I go, what the hell's going on? Did somebody bug my office? And, I'm going to the, and, and then I finally go up to the computer. And it's actually the alarm, my FBI alarm that there was an agent in the area. So I, I realized that was like the main guy that was like uh, hunting for me. And uh, I realized that he actually called a payphone across the street from the apartment I was at. Now, I, I slept home. I was there at the time. So I knew, it. well, they didn't come to arrest me. Did they come to follow me? And then I thought, oh, maybe they came to search. So, you know, of course, I cleaned up my apartment. And because uh, I didn't want to leave anything they'd be interested in. And then... The next day, I thought to go to Winchell's Donuts. So I got a big box of donuts, and I wrote FBI Donuts on it and put it in the refrigerator with a note <laughs> with a note on the refrigerator that I had donuts for them. So the next day, they actually came and searched, and they were pretty unhappy. Did they take any donuts? <laughs> they didn't eat any donuts, though. I don't know why. Maybe they thought I poisoned them or something. So as a kid, I just did these like you know crazy things. You know, um, uh, I, I was mostly interested in hacking telephone systems really as a trophy. So I'd like try to compromise switches in all these different areas just to see if I could do it. It wasn't really I ended up whole pranks. And then, then I started moving on. I wanted to learn about how to become a better hacker. So I would uh, get access to source code, like a VMS source code you know, that DEC had developed. So I could analyze it for security vulnerabilities so I could find holes that would make me more adept at compromising those systems. So it's more like hacking into the companies, get the source code, leverage the information to become a better hacker. Yeah. But in reading the book, earlier on, you also took interest in creating false identities, almost like you knew what was coming on. Well, not really. This is when I was 11 years old. I always like to know things that you shouldn't know. And there was this book Keep in Los Angeles. Yeah. There was this book store in Los Angeles called the Survival Bookstore, and they had books on lock picking, on creating new identities. I mean, just all the secret underground stuff. And then they actually sold lockpick sets. And I remember you had to be 18 years or older to buy a lockpick set. So one of the books that I bought at the survival bookstore showed where you could mail away and get a false ID that said you're 18. I'm, I'm 12. So I get a false ID that I'm 18. I go to the lady at, at the same store and I go, oh, I'm 18. She looks at it and she laughs. She goes, okay, Kevin. <laughs> Gives me my lockpick set. But, um, so I learned like at a very young age of how the system works and, and the holes. And there's this book called The Paper Trip by a guy named uh, Barry Reed uh, that described how to create new identity in America and disappear. So I, 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 but I never expected I'd have to use it later. I just wanted to know how. So when, when did you start using that knowledge? Oh, when I, uh, in about 1992, right after the FBI donuts thing. <laughs> And one of the first identities that you picked was, uh, was Eric Weiss. Yes, uh, Eric Weiss, because my, you know, my idol at the time was a man named Harry Houdini, and his real name was Eric Weiss. So at the time, I was living in Denver, Colorado, and uh, uh, I had to get a job, you know, because I was running from the government at the time, and I had to get a job, and I needed a legitimate identity, so I, cho I chose Eric Weiss. And I found out later, you know, I had a sense of humor, but much later I found out the FBI had no sense of humor. So this is when I did like one of the, uh, you know, one of the uh, attacks that I discussed in the book was on Motorola. And I, <laughs> and I forgot to bring something. I just remembered. I, I wish I could have shown you the brochure for this thing called the MicroTac Ultralight. And this thing was like the iPhone of today, this device. I don't know if you remember these like uh, Star Trek type flip phone cell phones. And as a hacker, I wanted to understand how it worked. I wanted to know you know, the internal protocols, how the, you know, the firmware was put together. So I made a very stupid and regrettable decision. I decided to go after the source code for the handset. So 
one afternoon, I left the office early in Denver. I called the toll-free number, you know, for 800 directory assistance, and I asked for Motorola, and I was given the number, and I called the number, got a receptionist, and I said, hey, I'm looking for the project manager of the Microtech Ultralight project. And the nice lady told me that all the cellular development was handled out of Schaumburg, Illinois. So she goes, would you like that number? I go, certainly. She gave me that number. I call the Schaumburg receptionist, and I tell her I'm looking for the project manager of the Microtech Ultralight project. And um, I'm transferred around two, three, four, about eight times. I'm talking to different people. And then I end up talking to the vice president of all of research and development for Motorola cell phones, all their mobility. And I say, hey, I'm looking for the project manager of the Microtech project. This is Rick over in Arlington Heights. Because during the last eight calls, I found out they actually had an Arlington Heights facility. And he goes, sure. He gave me the t her phone number and says, well, can I help you with anything? And I said, no, 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 no. I'll just talk to Pam. Because Pam was the uh, lady that was the project manager. So I call Pam. And I don't get her. I get her at voicemail outgoing greeting saying that she just left on a two-week vacation the date she was returning, and she said on her voicemail, if you need any help with anything whatsoever, please call Alicia on extension blah, blah, blah. Who's my next call to, right? I call Alicia. I go, hey, Alicia, this is Rick over in Arlington Heights. Uh, I'm looking, uh, I go, wait a second, did Pam leave on vacation yet? Because when I spoke to her you know, last week, she said she might be going on vacation. Oh, she has. Well, before she left, she promised to uh, send me the uh, source code to the Microtech Ultralight. <laughs> and I was walking, now imagine I'm already walking home. I live a 20 minute, uh, I live 20 minutes away by walking from the law firm and it was snowing that day. So as I'm walking through traffic, I'm trying to press the cell phone really tight to my ear so you can't hear all the traffic because I never expect this to work because it's all extemporaneous. And, uh, and, then, and then Alicia goes, well, Rick, what version do you want? <laughs> and I didn't even know the version numbers because, again, this was all off the cuff. And I just go, how about the latest and the greatest? So she's fishing around on the computer. I could hear her typing. I'm trying to walk out of traffic onto side streets. And she goes, Rick, I found, I, I found the latest source code release. It's docked to, uh, but there's a problem. I go, what's the problem? She goes, well, there's lots of directories and there's you know, tons of files in each directory. And I go, do you know how to use tar in gzip? <laughs> and she goes, and she goes, no, I don't. I said, would you like to learn? And she said, yes. <laughs> so I became her instructor for the day, and I taught her how to use tar and gzip. And at the end of the lesson, there was a three megabyte file of the source code I wanted to look at. So of course, my next question was, do you know what FTP is? <laughs> she goes, file transfer program. I go, yes, exactly. And then as I'm walking, I go, because I didn't prepare for this, is I couldn't give her, oh, my, I, you know, my host name is hacker at you know, colorado.edu, <laughs> right? So I actually had to remember, I remembered an IP address to a server that I had a bunch of accounts on, and I gave her the IP address. She tries connecting two, three, four, five times, times out each time. And then she goes, Rick, I go, yeah. She goes, I need to talk to my security manager about what you're asking me to do. I go, no, 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 because she's already putting me on hold, because that's the last person. I didn't want her to talk to someone like Aaron. That'd be bad. <laughs> so I'm walking, I'm walking, and the time is like, the, the seconds feel like minutes, and I'm really nervous. They're going to like record my call. And so I was very careful when she, you know, was going to return to the line. I was, gonna, I was going to be not saying words. You know, I was just going to be, try, try to feel it out. So about five minutes later, she comes back on the line. She goes, Rick, uh-huh. I, I talked to my security manager about what you want me to do. I go, huh, that IP address you gave me is outside of Motorola's campus. Uh-huh, you know, notice I'm not talking. She goes, and we need to use a special proxy server to send these files. <laughs> and I don't have an account on the proxy server. But my security manager was kind of this to give me his personal username and password. <laughs> to send you the file. So within 15, 20 minutes, I had the source code to the Microtech Ultralight. 
all I really did was look at it because I was you know, curious how it worked out. What I really wanted to do at the time, since the government was chasing me, I wanted to create invisibility. So if I had the, the firmware, I could actually modify it because how AMPS worked that day is you can control the registration and the paging processes, and I wanted to have better control so I couldn't easily be tracked. But you know, like a company like you know, Motorola had you know, all the best technology money can buy, and it, and it was an extemporaneous attack that actually worked. I was really surprised. Yeah. So let's fast forward to actually getting caught. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what was ultimately the demise that uh, got you caught? Well, um, actually, there was a guy, Satomu Shimomura, that became involved because his, uh, his server was hacked. And uh, this, guy, this guy was kind of an arrogant security expert. If you Google him, you'll uh, find out who he was. And we wanted like, to take him a couple notches down. It was more of that type of thing. And, uh, and then he went on a vigilante mission, and uh, he, he and the FBI actually teamed up to capture me. And uh, they ended up, you know, in the long run, they ended up actually going out with radio direction finding gear and tracing the cellular signal to determine my whereabouts, because I was in a fixed location in Raleigh, North Carolina, because I just moved there, and I underestimated the amount of time that the government worked, because nor ordinarily they're quite slow. And... Um, and they were able to trace the, 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 the signal. And then um, I get it. And, and then I was just, and they were able to trace the signal. And then the night this happened, I actually um, was out. I was actually going to work out at the gym that night. And I, got, and I arrived home late around, I don't know about, no, I went, then I went to go eat dinner. I arrived home around 11.30 that night, something like that, 11.30 or 12. And by that time, the FBI has this whole apartment building under surveillance because they believe the signal was on the other side of the complex in North Carolina. So I just parked my car. I have no idea that it's all full of feds. I go up to my apartment, and the, the story's in the book. There's a lot more to this, but I'm just trying to get to the cut to the chase. And then I just had a gut feeling that something was wrong. I just had this, this nagging gut feeling. So I opened the door on a, around 1 in the morning, and I peered out into the parking lot, and I just go, I must be being paranoid. And I shut the door. That, the, me opening the door and looking out was how they actually found me. Because they, they couldn't track the signal because the signals were bouncing. And then I get a knock on the door, and it's 1.30. And, and to me, I keep hackers hours. I, I stay up late and I sleep late. And I just, just um, my reaction was, who is it? And it was, FBI, open up. And uh, I go, who are you looking for? They go, are you, are you Kevin Mitnick? I go, no. I go, go check the mailboxes downstairs because you have the wrong apartment. And uh, they left for about 10 minutes. <laughs> and at that time, in that 10 minutes, I'm looking for, I'm on the second story, I'm looking for a rope to go down the other side of my patio to get the hell out of there. And, I, and I, there was nothing, you know, I didn't prepare, so I didn't have a rope, and I wasn't going to tie bed sheets together because I didn't want to, you know, get shot on the way down. So they, they, they knocked again, and I was on, already on the phone with my family and with uh, an attorney. And, uh, and they're knocking, and I go, you know, they go, are you Kevin Mitnick? I already told you I'm not. It's 1.30 in the morning. You, got, you have the wrong apartment, you know. And then I finally, he goes, well, open up. We want to talk to you. I, I crack the door. All these agents pour in. They start searching, and uh, they ask me for, you know, a driver's license. I go, here I am, because I, had, had an, I was under a new name. And, uh, and they start searching. I'm asking where their search warrant is, and they're just ignoring me. And uh, eventually it gets to the point, you know, this is going on for a long time. They're searching my apartment. They really didn't find much. And they finally were asking again, are you Kevin Mitnick? I said, no, I just showed you my driver's license. I'm not this guy Mitnick. And then they handed me a wanted poster of myself and said, doesn't that look like you? <laughs> so I take the wanted poster and I'm looking at it. I study it and I'm thinking to myself, could I really get out of this? Right? <laughs> and I'm looking at it and I finally... Um, I finally go, no, that doesn't look anything like me, and I hand it back. <laughs> so eventually this, uh, this thing is going on for a while. Uh, one of these uh, agents opens a briefcase on my desk, you know, unlocks the briefcase, and he's about to go through it. And I had some very important papers, and they're like blank birth certificates I didn't want him to find. I figured I'd be suspicious. <laughs> so I, I, I went over to the table because I wasn't under arrest, and I said, hey, and he looks up, I slam the briefcase down, I lock it, and he goes, and his face turned red, of course, and uh, he took the briefcase to the kitchen because he was going to use a carving knife to actually open it up. 
And then the other agent stopped him because it would be a legal search, right, to open up the container. So then finally the FBI went to go get a search warrant. And, uh, uh, and then during that process they found a wallet and then they found a pay stub in the name of Kevin Mitnick because I had a, a ski jacket that I had a pay stub from like 1980-something that I inadvertently left in there. And then they finally arrested me. So it was like this whole three and a half hour ordeal. And I was trying to, to get out of it. And at, at one point before they found it, they said, well, you know what? We're not sure if you're Mitnick or not. So we're going to take you down to the FBI and fingerprint you. And then we're going to compare the fingerprint records to rule out that you're, you know, to rule out that you're Mitnick. I said, why didn't you think of that before? We could have saved all this time. In fact, tell me what time you want me to show up at your office tomorrow and you can fingerprint me. <laughs> I tried my best. It didn't work. <laughs> but the craziest thing is, I, I, I think, is the time that um, when I was in court and they had told the judge that not only do they have to detain me, uh, but because I'm a national security threat, that they actually have to uh, keep me away from the phone. And the reason they had to keep me away from the phone is I could pick up the phone and I could whistle the launch codes to start a nuclear war. So, <laughs> I, I'm serious. So I, I actually laughed in court, right? Because I, because I, I figured the, the prosecutor was going to lose all credibility with the judge. Unfortunately, the judge uh, bought it, and I ended up, you know, in solitary confinement for eight and a half years. So during this time in solitary confinement, I perfected how I could whistle the launch codes, and I want to share that with all of you today. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 you know, now I need a phone because if I'm going to connect to NORAD, I need some connectivity. So I'm going to connect to the phone here. So give me a second. And uh, what we're going to do here now, you might have to take cover. <laughs> I'm sorry. The York's gone. No. But, I mean, I, the timing was wrong in that, but I thought that would be funny. But, uh, yeah, so back then when, when I was involved in hacking, I mean, it was all mysterious. The Internet wasn't really so popular it is today. You know, they looked at you like as a dark, like as a witch, like a dark, you know, magician or warlock. And, it, and, they, were, and they had such fear that they would actually, that people actually believed you could whistle the launch codes. So... That wasn't the only myth that was made about you, right? I mean, you have several. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, there's just so many. I mean, <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, that I, you know, hacked into NORAD and, and uh, nearly started World War III. That actually was stated as fact in the New York Times. And that was actually from a movie called War Games in 1983. <laughs> yeah. But I was under this severe, you know, I was, under, I was in high security in federal prison during this, you know, when I was detained. And I was in what they call the hole. And this was a solitary confinement. So if you are like the Mexican mafia, if you're, you know, Al Capone, if you're Killick prison guard, they put you in this place that you're just under 23, 24 hour lockdown. And I had a special phone restriction that I was only allowed to call like five people, my mom, my grandmother, my aunt, my attorney. And so I figured, you know, I'm kind of at the, at the bottom of the bucket here in solitary confinement in a federal detention center. But, you know, that didn't stop me from phone hacking. <laughs> Not at all. So you were hacking from prison. Hacking from prison. Let me tell you how. Is, um, <laughs> is whenever I had to make a phone call, they would actually shackle my arms, shackle my legs. They'd walk me like 30 feet to this room that had a bank of pay phones. And uh, the guard would look at, you know, the numbers I can call. He'd say, which number do you want, Mitnick? And he would dial zero plus the number to get because it was a collect call, obviously. And he'd place his chair four feet away from the payphones. So he'd just sit there, and what, his eyes would never move from what I'm doing. And I and the handset cord on the payphone was a little bit longer than it is like on the street. I guess they're longer in federal prison. Who knows? So I'd walk back and forth when I was talking, and I would constantly be scratching my back, you know, switching phones, just getting him used to this behavior, scratching my back, and actually rub my back against the payphone. And then I figured when I ended the call, I acted like I was still talking to the person that he dialed. And I just, you know, keep talking. I'd be rubbing my back. And then behind my back, I would just hang up, you know, hang, you know, push down the switch hook. And then I'd move my hand to the front because I knew that I had 18 seconds before the phone went into reorder, meaning beep, 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 beep. 
So I had 18 seconds to do this. So I just continue to scratch and then I put my hand behind again and dial zero plus the number I wanted because I was able to dial the touch tone behind my uh, touch tone pad. I was able to dial a phone number behind my back. And then I'd have to continue in the conversation because I knew within a, you know, 30 seconds the operator was going to come on the, you know, come on the line and ask who the collect call was from. So I'd have to say, well, you know, tell Uncle Harry that Kevin says hi. And when I said Kevin, that's when the operator is asking who the collect call is from. So this is how I was able to call anyone I wanted, you know, even though the guard, even though I was in, you know, plain sight of this, you know, uh, this officer. And this was working for like three weeks. <laughs> and then. Early one morning, my door opens, and it's like the executives of the prison, they put me in handcuffs, they take me to this like attorney-client visiting room, and they sit me down, and the captain of the prison goes, Mitnick, how you doing it? How you redialing the phone? I go, what are you talking about? Our officer is watching every move you make, and somehow you're redialing the phone. I said, hey guys, I'm not David Copperfield. <laughs> Because I wasn't going to admit to anything. Then they say, well, we're monitoring everything you do downstairs, which I knew they were. And I just said, maybe there's a failure in your monitoring system. You know, because you know, still, you know, I'm not going to admit anything because then they could use it against you. So, so a couple days later, I hear some uh, commotion outside the door. And I peek out, and it's Pacific Bell. And they're installing a phone jack across the corridor from where my, uh, where my room was. And I'm thinking are these guys actually going to install a phone in my room and then try to restrict who I can call? That's going to be fun. Yeah. And I found out what happened after is they actually, next time I had to make a call, the guard brings a phone, he plugs it in, he dials the number I want, then he puts the hand cord through this like trap door in the door. So I only have the handset. I can't touch the touch tone pad. It's beyond the locked door. And then I'm having a flashback to Hannibal Lecter and Silence of the Lambs. So that was crazy. They were so embarrassed by this, they never told the court. So the court never found out that I was calling anybody that I wanted to, because they would look like fools. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, finally getting out, the free Kevin movement. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, a lot of stuff was happening in my case. Like, I was detained for four and a half years without trial, and, uh, you know, and a lot of civil liberties issues. So then 2600 Magazine actually started this free Kevin movement to kind of, you know, like, why is this guy denied the ability to help his lawyer look at the evidence? Why has he been held for so many years, you know, in custody without a trial? So they started this whole Free Kevin movement. And it was, and, and I, I couldn't believe this. One day I was in my room in, in detention, and I look out this, like, they have a slitted window. And I look out, and I heard they were having Free Kevin protests that day. And I look, and I see an airplane flying, like a, a, a puddle jumper, and it was pulling a Free Kevin banner on an airplane. And I could see this from my prison cell. So I was like, kind of like, wow, you know, like I never expected this. And anyway, they were trying to get the word out to, um, it wasn't like the free Kevin movement was saying, hey, this guy shouldn't be punished for his hacking. It was more like, you know, why is he held for, in, detained for so long? You know, why, why is the judge not allowing his lawyers to look at the evidence? So there, it was kind of to get the word out. And, uh, and they did a good job of it, you know. And uh, ultimately, did it help my case? No. Because the government doesn't care really about you know protests, but um, eventually I made a deal with the government. After uh, uh, well, the reason I made the deal is uh, I found this case. Um, since I was hacking for more curiosity, I wanted to look at the source code to become a better hacker. It wasn't about selling the source code. It wasn't about you know doing anything with it, but using it to leverage it to hack in. And um, I found this case called uh, this case. Uh, this IRA agent, IRS agent called Richard, his name is Richard Sabinski, and uh, he was doing the same thing. He was working for the IRS, but actually looking up people's tax returns uh, because he was curious. You know, he wanted to know how much money they made and all this sort of thing. And uh, he was prosecuted for the same char you know, crimes that I was. And he actually appealed his case, and this was a federal case, saying, well, he did it out of curiosity. He didn't sell the information. He didn't disclose it to anybody. It was a case of curiosity, and the and the federal appellate court said, well, if it's if it's if you didn't use or disclose the information, it's not a federal crime. So I actually wanted to go to trial, saying, hey, I did all this hacking. You're right. You know, I did everything, but I did it for this purpose. You know, was more my curiosity and learning. It wasn't about using or disclosing it for monetary gain. And uh, my lawyer told me that the federal prosecutor at the time 
said, uh, told him, warned him that if your client doesn't take a deal, we're just going to, we're going to try him here. Let's say we, we lose. We're just going to move him to this jurisdiction and try him there. We don't care if we win or lose because we'll keep your client in custody so long that it won't matter anyway. Because you've hacked in many jurisdictions. Right, well, when you're doing, uh, you know, when you're hacking over dial-up, I mean, this is dial-up in these days over the internet, you're going through so many different jurisdictions, they could just put you on the bus for this ever-ending, you know, series of trials. So I just figured, hey, you know, I, I wanted to settle it on the best terms possible. And one big negotiating point is they didn't want me to tell my story for life. In fact, another hacker named Kevin Polson, who recently wrote a, a great book called Kingpin, he's an editorial I think he's the uh, editorial director of Wired.com, and uh, his deal is he can't write his story for life, right? And so uh, we, my attorney negotiated, and, and it was a seven years. For seven years, I was pretty much blacked out from being able to tell my story, and that expired in 2007. Then I teamed up with this uh, awesome co-author. Uh, his name is Bill Simon, and he's actually here today in his audience with his girlfriend. He's right over here, Bill. Why don't you come up here and say hi to everybody? Okay, he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to come up to stage. But this book would have not been possible without Bill. I mean, Bill uh, put up with my hackers' hours for two years. I mean, Bill's the type of guy that rises at six, has breakfast at seven, and he's hard at work at eight. I'm going to bed at eight. <laughs> so, so, but we finally got it done, and uh, I, I thank Bill because without him. Um, the book Ghosts in the Wires would not be here for all of you to read. And so thank you, Bill. I, I appreciate your hard work. Now, uh, not only not being able to tell your story for seven years, you also had some other restrictions as part of your release. Oh, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't touch a, a, a transistor. Anything with a transistor in it was restricted. I, uh, the federal government... Uh, was so, I don't know if they were scared or if they were trying to punish me or what the reason was, but anything with electronics, I wasn't allowed to touch without their permission. So even to use a fax machine. And then after two years, it was really interesting because I was commissioned to write Art of Deception, again with Bill, which was my first book on social engineering. And what had happened is I called the probation department saying, hey, I was researching word processors that have no way to connect to a modem, no way to connect to the internet, just like standalone. I spent like a couple weeks researching this stuff, and then I presented the case to the probation department. Hey, I could use this word processor, so I could you know work on this book with my co-author, and my and the probation officer said, hey, you know, Kevin, we're going to let you get a laptop. What? Yeah, they're going to let me get a lap. They they allowed me to get a laptop under two conditions. One is I don't tell the media. That was the biggest condition. Two is I don't connect to the internet. So then I was able to finally write uh, you know Art of Deception with Bill. I mean, there's just so many stories to tell. I don't know where you, uh, I, I, I mean, there's just, it's just uh, crazy. So uh, one last one and okay. then we'll open up to questions. Through the book, it, it's pretty obvious that you have an addiction to hacking. I would call it an extreme passion. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what drove me. I mean, I remember when I was in my younger years, when I, uh, it, this is how, I guess, passionate I was, is when I was young, my parents couldn't afford a computer. Oh, and let me remind you how I started off on this path, is when I went to, my first programming assignment in high school was to write a Fortran program to find the first 100 Fibonacci numbers. And I thought that was a boring assignment. So I thought it would be cooler to write a program to steal everyone's password. <laughs> Just for the fun of it. And what we had at school was an Olivetti 110 baud terminals, acoustic coupler modems, and we had a PDP-11, uh, I think it was like an 1134 running risc to seed in, in downtown Los Angeles. And so all the students used VT100 terminals to connect to the school's computer. So I wrote a program that would be a login simulator, kind of like a phishing tool. So people would think they're logged out. They would type in hello. It would ask them to put in their username and password. It would log them in. This was my first program, the first one that I ever wrote. It wasn't hello world. It was I'm going to steal your password. <laughs> so... So I worked really hard on it because I had to like, do syscalls, interact with the operating system. It wasn't as easy as finding the first 100 Fibonacci numbers. And, uh, and because I spent so much time on this assignment, I wasn't able to finish or even do, start the Fibonacci assignment. So it was due. So the teacher goes, Kevin, where's your assignment? 
I let you into class, I waived your prerequisites, and you're not, you're not even you know, holding your weight here. I said, well, I was busy working on this other program. Let me show you how it works. <laughs> so I showed him the program of stealing passwords. And he goes, that's awesome. <laughs> but he, and he gave me an A. <laughs> that's awesome. He actually showed it to everyone else in class. Look what Kevin did. And I got all these attaboys. So the ethics taught when I was in high school <laughs> that hacking is cool. And there was, it wasn't even illegal. It was 1979. They didn't have the first computer crime law in 1984. So I started in an era where it was encouraged to do this stuff because it was like no harm, no foul. You know, I wasn't stealing passwords because I want to get in their accounts. It was more like just for doing it. You know, so it was kind of like a cool thing. The teacher liked it. You know, so. so do you still have this uh, deep passion today? I hack every day. But I, there's only one difference. I have authorization. So... Companies that hire me to break into their systems give me a jail, get out of jail free card. And as long as I have that card in my pocket, I feel really comfortable. And I can still get to do the same thing I was doing 20 years ago today. And, all, and the, the techniques still work, like social engineering. I mean, the technical exploits change. You know, as we build more complex systems, it creates more vulnerabilities, as you know. So we, you, know, you have the technical side, which, you know, now you could download Metasploit. You, you have commercial products, uh, products like Canvas and Core. Metasploit is awesome. If you're, I don't know if how many of you know of Metasploit here in the audience, but um, these tools weren't available when I was hacking. It was like you had to do it on your own. There was, there were, you know, there was no, you know, frameworks. No, not where you can go and Google. You know, Google didn't exist, by the way. I couldn't, I couldn't Google, you know, exploits. You know, it was all on your own. And today, I mean, uh, what kids can do, uh, which I didn't have this option, was, you know, they could, you know, have, you know open source Linux boxes, you know, for, you know, next to nothing. They could get access to frameworks like Metasploit. So they could experiment and have fun hacking, you know, legitimately. And I didn't have this option when I was, it just didn't exist. So what I chose to do was go to universities, all the Cal State universities in Los Angeles, and I would, until I wore out my welcome, right? And all the radio shacks in Los Angeles, yeah. <laughs> Great. Let's. Uh, we have a couple of microphones. If you could just raise your hand, a microphone will come to you. <laughs> Somebody hacked your mic. I don't need a mic. I'm loud enough. <laughs> I had a three cabin stick here on my lap door at AT&T. <laughs> Did you ever use the name Nuspa? No. That was a myth. Because a friend of mine got arrested at CFP. Yeah, I heard about that. They thought he, uh, he was me. And they arrested him when I was a fugitive, unfortunately. And then, I guess, they thought I was using his name. I never used it. Uh, the names I used was Eric Weiss, Brian Merrill. Uh, they're all in my book, the names I used. It was a handful, but never his name. Never even talked. To, I never even knew the guy. So that, again, was another myth. <laughs> <laughs> tell, him, tell him it wasn't me. Yeah, they also arrested another guy who they thought was the informant in my case, a guy named Eric Hines, his real name is Justin Peterson, and, and they, they actually were almost going to arrest, I think, Robert Steele, who's an ex-CIA agent who does a lot of talks at conferences. And they, the agent actually asked him to pick up his you know, pants on one leg because the real Justin had a, you know, had a prosthetic leg, and uh, they were almost going to arrest him because you know, they're, they're just going crazy. They wanted to arrest somebody, but they kept getting the wrong people. Any other questions? Yes. Um, oh, thank you. With the... No. <laughs> Just speak now. Right. <laughs> With everybody getting so connected, I mean, that's kind of what we do here, um, making sure that everybody's connected and everything's accessible to everybody as much as possible. Um, is security intractable for regular people? I mean, I know that social engineering always worked and probably always will work, but you can get so much further with it now because you can, you know, send out... Spear phishing, yeah. Yeah, you can, you can try and scam 10 million people at a clip. Is this an intractable problem that we're just going to be in this situation forever? 
No, I don't really know. I mean, the, I, I look at the solutions to social engineering as using technology whenever possible to take the decision making out of the, you know, the human actor's, you know, uh, hand, so to speak. And then uh, training in it, you know, a lot of training in education. A, a lot of the, you know, don't forget the, the social engineering usually re also relies on some technical vulnerability like an older version of Adobe Acrobat, you know, that the person's using. So, I mean, by keeping the technology up to date, I think you mitigate the social engineering because if you look, most of the attack vectors today are client side. So you're looking to exploit the browser, you're looking to exploit Adobe Acrobat, Flash, Java, uh, the media players, the instant messaging tools. So I find that a lot of my clients, they're not keeping that stuff up to date. And that's how I'm able to exploit them. Now, I, I just had a client, a uh, uh, multi-million dollar client, and they were running uh, like version, I think, 9.1 of Adobe. And how I found, uh, what I did was I used social networking to find to create my target list on LinkedIn. It's so, you know, it's easy. You can even use Google, of course. But, you know, you find, you try to look for network administrators and engineers and, and people that are likely have uh, domain admin rights. And you target those people first, right? So I was able to, uh, so I, I found out who this administrator uh, works with at one of the companies that supports uh, one of their IT functions and emailed them a PDF. Of, uh, that it had an exploit in it. He opened it up and was able to get into his box. He had domain admin rights and the game was over. I mean, it was just that easy. Um, if he had, a, had an updated version of Adobe at the time because the problem was patched, you know, maybe the social engineering side would have worked, but it wouldn't have got me anywhere. Right. Push your clients to Chrome OS or, or Chrome. <laughs> <laughs> I use Chrome. I shouldn't tell you this because now maybe I could be a target. <laughs> One last question. Let's give somebody. Oh, go ahead. So you mentioned uh, writing a hello world program, right? And uh, you mentioned how your teacher kind of encouraged you to, you know, it was encouraged to to hack, and it was cool. Well, it was after I wrote the first program because I didn't tell the teacher what I was doing the first during the first what, during that development. So uh, I'm curious if you feel that education for developers has changed in any regard because I still find that. When we're trying to get people into computers and, and development, we still kind of go, look how easy this is. Print, hello world. Great, you wrote your first program. It's really easy. Well, we I, don't build on a stronger foundation of, oh, well, here's the building blocks and security. Well, absolutely. I mean, um, most, most, of the, most of the time where our methodology, well, most of the time where we're able to get into a client's uh, infrastructure is usually by exploiting a web app, usually with something like SQL injection. I mean, it's, I mean, and so if the developers of those applications, you know, you know, sanitize their input, um, we weren't, we wouldn't be able to get in, you know, at, the, at that point. So I find that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there. There's lots of uh, uh, web application, internet-facing web ac applications that are insecure and easy to exploit. I mean, case in point is you have like Lulsec, right? They're out exploiting everybody in the world. You know, they're doing some stupid attacks with DDoS attacks, but a lot of all the other victims are, you know, simple SQL injection. Look at Sony; they were hacked 12 times, and I think uh, like 10 of those hacks were SQL injection hacks, right? So uh, the developers obviously they either bought the code from somebody else, bought the application from a third party who obviously didn't have secure coding practices, you know, in their development cycle, uh, and or they did, did it in house, and it was just shoddy security and got got hacked. So I guess, I guess the question is then, why hasn't education changed? For developers, or well, they have it available. It's just the question of companies actually using it in their development cycle. Well, companies and schools, right? Why? Right. Are, oh, school. The liability laws are in, the, the liabilities are in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. Credit cards used to be um, if you. The thing that enabled uh, the the problem is that the liability laws are in the wrong place. Um, when credit cards first came out, um, there was a question of who gets who has to pay for the fraud. Right. And the answer was the user has to pay for the fraud, and so users didn't want it. And then when the law said uh, the bank has to pay for the fraud, there's 50, you know, the, right. both the user, or it was either the user or the merchant, but somebody, you know, if, if the user has to pay for the fraud, the, the users don't want it. So they say, well, let's make the merchants pay for the fraud, and the merchants don't want it. So they made the bank pay for the fraud. All of a sudden, the liability and the incentives are in the right place, and the banks fought against it. They said, oh, no, you can't make us pay for the fraud. It's not our fault, you know, and... And you know the law just said, well, pay for it anyway. At which sudden point the bank said, oh, all right. At which point credit cards had this amazing round, you know, round of growth because the bank said, okay, well, we'll 
cut down the fraud to a level that we are willing to, that people are willing to pay for in the interest rate. And so it's really just liability. Right. I mean, uh, and I think today it's, uh, it's on the merchant, actually, as, uh, is the fraud. I mean, unless, uh, you know, Visa and MasterCard, um, you know, if you go through secure code, they have, if you, um, what is the product called, MasterCard, secure code, and Visa verified, if you go through those mecha mechanisms, then the bank takes the risk. But I think today it's the merchant. It still takes it still takes the risk on transactions, right? Hey Kevin, I, I think we're, we're going to broadcast yeah. this, so maybe just parting thoughts. As oh yeah, we're recording. In, inspiring hackers <laughs> uh, or security researchers uh, for somebody that's been there, done that, I, been I, behind I, bars. <laughs> I mean, I just love what I do. I mean, I, I my primary uh, reason for getting involved in the hacking was the intellectual curiosity. Uh, the, the challenge, and most importantly, the learning. And I wanted to learn everything that I possibly could. And uh, I still have those drivers today. When I'm testing my client's security, I still get that endorphin rush when I'm able to find a security hole. So I really enjoy what I do. It's almost like, uh, you know, it's almost like not working. But I mean, my recommendations is if you're de developing applications, is you, that you do use secure coding practices so people like me can't get in. You can make our pen test harder. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, um, I, I guess, if, unless you have any other questions, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Check out the book. Oh, yeah. Book. <laughs> Why am I here? Ghost in the Wires. It, I mean, you get a lot more detail about what had happened, why I did it, how I did things. That's in the book. Again, it was a two-year uh, two um, project. I told Bill what I wanted this book to be was like a catch-me-if-you-can thriller. So we were able to take my, my story because of all the crazy stuff I did as a, as a kid, and I thought we actually met the goal. And I'd, I'd love to hear your feedback. You'll have my email address on my card. If you like the book, dislike it, find an error, let me know. I, I definitely would appreciate it. And uh, I love Google. You guys are, you guys, um, uh, I, Google is my homepage on my browser, and I do use Google Chrome. And I love touring your campus in Mountain View. It was awesome. It was like a little city. So, uh, I think you guys are working for an awesome, a great company. So thank you for being here. And uh, I have business cards for everybody. I, I didn't run out. I just wanted to get uh, kill some time until Aaron came uh, and was ready to interview. So um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.